Hey, this is Jen Pilcher, Navy spouse of 23 years, and when I'm not helping military spouses connect in our digital community, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and have you ever given money and hoped it'd help change the world? How come so many gifts don't make any change at all? Today, we'll talk to the woman who's trusted advisor to many of the world's richest philanthropists, Chris Putnam Walkerly. Plus, we'll also throw out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky caller and, of course, save time for my superstitious trivia. And now, two guys who didn't know that there's no crying down in the basement. It's Joe and O J J J J G. We're crying all the way to the mics. Hey, everybody! Welcome to Monday. I am Joe Salci. I ever Joe Money on Twitter. Let me be the first one to welcome you to another week here in Mom's basement and across the card table from me. The guy who's preparing for the biggest day of his life this year, the anniversary of the biggest day of his life, the day that Mrs. OG agreed to marry him. It's said maybe Mr. OG. She said, like maybe. The, yeah. Do you, do you, we'll see. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> your, your, your vow was I do hers is we'll see. Yeah. Her, her vow was for now. Yeah. Let me think about it. <laughs> One thing you don't got to think long about, OG, is using Fiverr. Big thanks to Fiverr for supporting Stacky Benjamins. Huh? Huh? It's so easy to find freelance talent for your business or product. Don't waste any more time. Get 10% off and the service you deserve by going to FIVERR.com and use code SB. Big thanks to Fiverr for supporting Stacky Benjamins. We've got a great show today. We're going to talk about giving. And if there's ever a time, I think that we needed to think about giving and being more giving and how to give better. It's on a day like today. And uh, Chris Putnam Walkerly is a great woman to talk about that. And even though she works with some huge philanthropists, OG, I think we're going to want to talk about how really we're all philanthropists. Cool. I, like I think that. that's a way we need to think about life on a day like today. So let's get this party started first with a couple headlines. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline comes to us from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and Never this is <laughs> this is written by Akane Otani and Sebastian Pellahero. Bankrupt in just two weeks. Individual investors get burned by collapse of complex securities. When William Mark decided to get back into investing after the 2008 financial crisis, he looked past stocks nope, and that's, bonds. That's the problem. Right. <laughs> I've already identified the issue. Who needs a stock or a bond if I'm going to invest? No, there it's better even products. before that. It's before that. It's the phrase before that. When I got back into it. Yes. After the two. So why, why were you out of it to begin with? Ready? Oh, the next sentence, it gets better. Needing to play catch up with his retirement portfolio. There you go. Yep. The second you get that gambler mentality, the piping engineer decided to bet on a complicated product he hoped would deliver double-digit annual returns. No offense to pipe engineers. It worked so well, earning him 18% a year in dividends on average, that he eventually poured $800,000. Can't lose, baby. Into the investments called... Leveraged exchange traded notes. It sounds totally legitimate. Or ETNs. When the coronavirus pandemic hit, he lost almost every penny. Quote, I'm 67 years old and I'm basically bankrupt in just two weeks, Mr. Mark said. You gotta know when to hold them. Know when to fold them. It just makes my stomach hurt. I f oh. I how, much he, uh, how much of the uh, prospectus he read? Prior to investing, here's the thing. There is no such thing as a free lunch. It has to be that way. I mean, just think about this just perfectly logically. Let's assume that we have all decided, call me crazy, 
that the biggest 500 companies in the United States average 10% a year for 100 years. Maybe, just so maybe, that happens to be the exact average. Okay. And along comes an investment strategy that purports to have a 20% rate of return per year. The biggest, biggest, largest, most well capitalized, most financed, most loved, most used companies in the entire history of the country average 10. But yet, there's this thing over here that gets 20. I do not say to you that 20 doesn't exist because it does. But you have to understand that there's another edge to that. There has to be. Otherwise, think of it this way, no one would put money in the S&P ever again. If there was literally a thing that got twice as much as the other thing with the exact same amount of volatility or risk, in this case, using risk the correct way, then everyone would do that. It has to be that way. There, It's the same reason why you can't get 10% a year in your CDs at the bank. Because if you got 10% in your CDs at the bank, no one would take the risk of stocks. Or stocks would have to average higher rates of return. Because you're putting capital at risk. So for every unit of risk, you have to get a better return. This is why small business owners generally are reticent to put money in the stock market. And I talk to people all the time. They say, well, why should I invest in the stock market? It's not because we're going to get better returns than your small business. Because you know, if you're a plumber, you know exactly how much money it takes for you to generate a dollar. You know exactly how many service calls, exactly how much advertising. And when you say, hey, I made 50 grand this year. And if I put 10,000 of this back into a new tool or a new technology or advertising, you know exactly how much return you're going to get on that. Easy to compute the return on investment. And you do for small businesses. But I will tell you this, if you're a small business owner and your business is growing at 10% a year and you're like, hmm, I've got an extra 20 grand this year of profit. What should I do with it? You're a fool to put it in your business at 10% because Amazon grows at 10% a year. You have to grow at 20% a year because you have that much more risk. You know what I mean? Like you have to have a better risk return profile. So if there's this public investment out there that's like, oh, this magical thing that I'm going to get 18.5% a year on, there's a catch. And people just get suckered into it. And you're right. I think it just gets to the point where it's like, hey, I've made all these mistakes or life happened and it got away from me. And all of a sudden I woke up and I'm 50 and I haven't saved a penny. I got to swing for the fences on every single solitary pitch. And the bad news about what happened to this gentleman is he also had early success doing it, which is, yeah. which is, by the way, the worst thing. That is absolutely the worst thing that could happen. I can think of two corollary stories to this. One being recently, let's call it the last decade, how large U.S. growth companies have trucked everything else. It is increasingly more difficult to convince people and even to convince yourself that you should have a diversified portfolio. When you go, yeah, but the S&P's kicked everyone's butt. Why should I have small caps again? This Why was, should I have international? This was 2000 with tech stocks. I remember yeah. in 1999 getting fired because my diversified portfolio performed in the mid 40s, mid 40 percent. And I got fired because his buddies were doubling their money and he wasn't. Yeah. And I was trying to tell him that, no, we need to stay diversified. He's like, no, no, no. This is the new economy. Remember that? It's the Bullshit. Yes, I do remember the new economy. Yes. This is the new economy. Yes, the rules the have changed. Economy. Everything's There's different. There's going to be another store ever again. Yes. You don't even have to have profits to and be a good stock. And then in 2002, I had to spend the entire week of my vacation to Mammoth Cave with my family an hour and a half a day on the phone because it was the bottom of the bottom and I had to talk my clients off the ledge. New economy. Hashtag new economy. <laughs> new economy ruined my flipping vacation. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great example. And the other story, and this is another example that you probably remember. This also happens, I think, in, in life and in business also. I remember a, a young advisor who started well after I did, but was crazy successful. And by successful, let me put an asterisk and write the word lucky, because there's nothing about his success that was earned. This person started as an advisor and made a million dollars his first year. He made a million dollars in the first year because he happened to call the right person that had the right problem 
that his manager could solve, basically, because he couldn't solve it because he was brand new. And I bet you can guess how long he stayed in the business. Six months. Yeah, because he had this early success and didn't have to put the work into it. This is true with almost everything. If you find yourself not, and we're not talking about investing anymore, but if you find yourself in a new endeavor and you're crushing it, that's going to be even more difficult to stay with it because people ahead of you maybe have put in a lot more energy and effort to get the same results or less results. And if you happen to have that combination of panache and luck that just works out, just recognize that I, you, you may be in for a period of time where it's not so fun, but this is ever so true with investing. And dang, it's painful to read this crap. Our friend uh, Larry Swedro, who's been on the show, he's chief research officer at wealth management firm Buckingham Wealth Partners, and just an all-around uh, great guy. Smart dude. Larry said, uh, if institutions aren't buying this, the retail investor shouldn't be either. Otherwise, they're the sucker at the poker table that doesn't know it. I love the way Larry put stuff. He says, if a product is so complex you can't explain it to your partner, then you shouldn't buy it. I think that's a great place to leave that one. Yeah. Our next headline comes to us from Market Watch. This is written by Jacob Passy. If airlines keep the middle seat empty due to fears of coronavirus transmission, will air travel become more expensive? I've been thinking about yeah. this a lot lately, haven't you? Yeah. I haven't, but I mean Yeah. At some point we're going to return to the air. And you have to wonder how V-shaped the pricing is going to go. Ever so, it must be thus. On, on airline tickets. It just, it just it costs a certain amount of money to put gas in an airplane, right? And it costs a certain amount of money to put a few pilots up front and some you know, flight attendants in the middle and people to throw your bags on and the fees to land at the airport and taxi to the gate. Like All that costs money. And if there's less people writing checks... It only stands. The money's not. The money's not coming out of the board of directors. Pocket. Right. Exactly. Not American Airlines. They're not like. <laughs> you know what? We should throw a little into the kitty. The business isn't doing so great right Let's now. Let's all pitch in. Well, we yeah. saw how they got in this mess in the first place. I mean, hey, how do I keep the stock up? I know we're going to do a bunch of buybacks instead of keeping an emergency fund. That's what we're going to do. Yeah. You know why? Yeah. Oh, we're going to go down this path. I you, didn't know that you were one of these guys. Okay. You know why? Because airlines are essential, and people won't let us go bankrupt. Which is funny because I read a fantastic piece recently that completely changed my mind on this. Because when I first heard that, I said, okay, regardless of all that, yes, airlines are essential. Yes, we need to fly. We need to be able to do that. And then somebody goes, no, 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 no. Airlines are not essential. You know what's essential? Aircraft. And if a company goes bankrupt, here's how it works. They sell the assets. And another person who actually knows how to do the right thing with your money comes in and picks up the pieces yeah, there's a whole there's a whole there's hangers full of aircraft right now i just yeah isn't that how uh branson started virgin atlantic or virgin airways i, I haven't studied it but i would imagine oh, he, he like literally had to fly from one place to another and the ticket was a bajillion dollars so he went screw this and he chartered a 737 and like stood outside the airport and sold his own tickets <laughs> some i uh, some variation of that story. It almost sounds went, like huh, I could I could make this work. The story of uh, Southwest Airlines is you know just being scrappy. Look at JetBlue yeah. in the early days and and getting started, and how in a lot of ways, and you kind of wish they did even more. Some of those companies revolutionized air travel and kept the big boys honest. But anyway, I don't want to get into a discussion about saving saving the companies, but. I think prices might go up. Let's see what Jacob says. He says, airline tickets are cheap right now, but don't expect that to last forever. Well, there it is. <laughs> Done. Okay. All right, moving along. I'm exhausted. Uh, he said, how cheap are flights? You can book round trip airfare in August between New York and Los Angeles for 62 bucks. According to a search on travel website, Kayak, for less than 200 bucks, you can get round trip airfare between Miami and dozens of destinations across Latin America and the Caribbean. Probably go to Brazil. Well, can't go to Brazil right now, can you? Be nice. You could just peer over into Brazil from whatever country is next to Brazil. Airlines have slashed the price of tickets as demand plummeted in the face of the global coronavirus pandemic. They've flown practically empty planes and pilots and flight attendants have faced the risk of furloughs and layoffs as airlines business is tanked. Meanwhile, travelers are sitting on millions of dollars in vouchers 
from carriers like Delta, American, JetBlue. The bad news about those vouchers, OG, is that no idea how to get them. I'm, try, I'm <laughs> trying to book an airline flight, and when I when I canceled mine, I said, "Well, how do I get the voucher?" Like, it's it, we got it. I said, "Cool." How do I get it? They said, "It's just it's on your account. Just call us when you're ready to use it." Like, I don't really want to call anybody ever again. That wastes everyone's time. Can I just have like a number or something? They're like, just we got to go. Trust us. It's we're good for it. Click. There's no incentive for them to keep prices low because those vouchers are worth more the longer they keep them low. And think about the millions of bucks they have to get through that they promised people for the canceled flight. Yeah. Like, because you missed a flight this spring does not mean you're going to take two in the fall. Right. You know what I mean? You're still only going to take one in the fall. And by the way, it's paid for this this spring. So what's the incentive to keep the price at? None. 300 bucks instead of 700 none Who the cares? second the second they can jack up the price they they need to like they don't want to they need to to stay solvent they need to jack up the price okay some have predicted that one or more airlines could go bankrupt warren buffett of course uh berkshire hathaway sold off its stake in airlines because of the pandemic Early on, many analysts expected a V-shaped recovery in air travel, said Scott Keyes, founder and chief flight expert at travel website Scott's Cheap Flights. That's clearly not borne out. Instead, we're looking at a stretched out Nike swoosh type recovery. Oh, a Nike swoosh recovery. Interesting. That's I, a new thing. I like that. That's cool. Interesting times coming. And I think that's the takeaway here, OG. Sitting on a voucher. You might want to think about ways to use that sooner rather than later so you get bigger bang for your buck, as mom says. And then second, can't explain the investment you're in to the people around you. Might be time to get out. There is nothing I'm more excited about talking about right now than giving. And I think that more than ever, being a part of a community and giving super, super important right now. That's why I was so excited when I saw this new book by Chris Putnam Walkerly. For 20 years, top global philanthropies and ultra high net worth donors, celebrity activists, foundations, Fortune 500 companies, they've all sought Chris's advice so that they could increase the impact that they have on giving. Whether you're somebody that can give your time and your energy or somebody that can give millions of dollars, let's talk about it. Chris Putnam Walkerly on My Dead Shortwave. And joining me on My Dead Shortwave, it's our new friend, Chris Putnam Walkerly. How are you? I'm awesome, Joe. How are you? Well, I'm fantastic, but I'm wondering this from you, Chris. Let's talk about this elephant in the room. I don't know if you've seen there's been this pandemic thing going around, (laughs) but apparently it's all over. We don't leave the basement, so I don't know. But how has that changed the face of giving in America? Great question. It's changed it quite a bit, and hopefully for a while. Some of the things that funders, philanthropists of all kinds have been doing is immediately responding and creating rapid response funds. So throughout the United States and increasingly around the world, there are funds being created where funders are coming together to jointly collaborate to support organizations in need, especially you know the first responders, meeting immediate health care needs, as well as other kinds of needs, you know, people who are homeless, who are suffering from domestic violence, of course, food needs, and people who are finding themselves unemployed and needing assistance. And so the great thing about these crisis response funds is that it coordinates effort so that there's not duplication of, you know, everybody funding the food pantry, but no one funding the domestic violence shelter. And they really allow all kinds of funders to come together. I mean, anybody can contribute. So that's one. Another response has been, You know, foundations, especially and corporate givers, have been uh, removing a lot of the tight restrictions that they previously had on grants and grantees. So many funders have, you know, just allocated additional funds to their existing grantees. They didn't have to apply for that money. I know one foundation, the Robert Sterling Clark Foundation in New York, just gave all of their grantees an extra entire year of funding, no questions asked. Many have been telling their grantees, whatever you were planning on using the funds for before this crisis, 
now you can use it for whatever you think is most important right now, because obviously everything has changed. And we trust you, nonprofit leader, to spend and allocate that money as best you see fit. So those have been some great changes and really offering a lot of you know what we call core operating support, which is just money to do whatever you think is the right thing to be doing at that time. And I'm really hopeful that a lot of those new best practices will stick beyond the pandemic when we're in recovery and, you know, when this is a thing of the past, because it is really helpful to be able to get the money out quickly and it, into the hands of people and organizations that really know the, the best way to spend it. We've already seen with the, uh, the payroll protection program for businesses that there are have been concerns about waste as the government handed out money really quickly as foundations release the purse strings more quickly. Do you expect six months from now, we're going to see a lot of exposés about waste happening in the, in the philanthropic area? No, I really don't. For the most part, you know, nonprofit leaders are, you know, they're not in it for the money, right? They're in it for the cause and they really believe in what they're trying to do. And, you know, nonprofit organizations are often the ones on the ground working in communities who really have a handle on what the needs are and how best to allocate resources and are experts in whatever issue it is that they're working on, if it's drug treatment or early childhood education or whatever it might be. And so, I think often one of the best things funders can do is really trust those leaders and have it build a trusting relationship with them so that there's clear communication and a willingness to support their work. You know, I think it's highly unlikely that we're going to find six months from now a nonprofit leader has, you know, absconded with the money and taken off to the Bahamas. I think more likely we're going to find some amazing innovation on the part of nonprofit organizations in, in terms of how they pivoted and adapted and used the funding. I want to jump into how all of us are really philanthropists, Chris, but to Mm -hmm. get there, the the world of philanthropies expanded a lot. I know we hear a lot about these things called donor advised funds, Mm -hmm. where instead of having the expense of setting up a foundation, the average person can get more involved in giving. Could, Could you explain to our listeners how a donor advised fund works and what it is? Absolutely. A donor advised fund is essentially, think of it as a charitable checking account. So let's say you have $5,000 or $50,000 or $5 million or whatever the amount is. You can allocate that and make a donation to to your donor advised fund that you set up. And you immediately get a tax benefit from that contribution. And then from there, you can use that fund to make grants and to support different nonprofits and causes that you care about. Another added value is when you set up one of these donor advised funds, you're setting it up within an existing organization. So it could be your local community foundation, and there are community foundations across the country and around the world uh, whose job it is to raise money from people in that community and then give it away to organizations and needs in those communities. And they often have a really good handle on what those needs are. They know the organizations, the nonprofits, and they can help you understand you know which are the right nonprofits to support and they handle all the transaction they handle the issuing of the check and the follow up and the tax reporting and whatnot for you so it's really like a turnkey solution and there are a lot of other kinds of organizations that do this you know some some of the biggest are fidelity charitable schwab charitable and other kinds of they call them donor advised fund sponsors american endowment fund i gift fund there's lots of them and they really make it easy for you because you know, the alternative could be to set up a, a foundation. And you really wouldn't want to do that unless you had unless you were giving away, I would say, maybe between two and five million dollars a year. So you'd really need twenty, forty million dollars to be able to do that, which is, you know, some people that's easy and for a lot of us that's not so easy. But regardless, when you create a foundation, you're creating a nonprofit five oh one C three organization. And that's a lot of work to set that up and to manage it. It might need to be staffed. So donor advised funds are a great alternative, but there are also lots of reasons why somebody would, would want to create a foundation. Well, and the cool thing, my understanding is of a donor advised fund, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you don't have to make a decision right away about what cause you, you support. You can put the money in the account and then you can invest it and uh, let it sit and maybe earn some interest that you donate later. Yeah, that's exactly right. So you can, let's say you sold your business and or came into a lot of wealth, or for whatever reason, you created this donor advised fund, you can park the money there, you get an immediate tax benefit, you know, and maybe you're, you inherited money and you because of the obviously the loss of someone that you cared about. So you're grieving, it might not be the right time for you to figure out what causes you care about. 
But I do think it's important that those donors do allocate that funding, you know, relatively quickly. Otherwise, you're getting this tax benefit, but the public is not getting the benefit uh, in terms of the money being allocated to nonprofit organizations. So actually, some of these sponsors, like Fidelity Charitable, they require that you start making grants. I think it's within three years. And if you don't, and they'll remind you, and they'll try to help you, but if you don't, they'll just start making them for you, (laughs) (laughs) which I think is really great. That is cool. Yeah, because I bet that they have checks and balances and, and look to organizations that they know are helping in communities. Well, right. And one of the criticisms of donor advised fund is sort of the opposite side of the coin, that donors are getting this benefit, but not allocating the money. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But in fact, donor advised fund donations exceed in terms of the percentage donations from foundations. So it really isn't that much of a concern, but it's certainly a possibility. So that makes many more of us philanthropists. And really, you say at at heart, we're all philanthropists. So I want to dig into who we give money to, because I mentioned that Fidelity, as an example, might have some checks and balances about who they look at. From a young age, I was always taught to look at the cost behind a group that I give money to, to make sure that the overhead is really low. And you say in your book, Delusional Altruism, Chris, that, that that's not the number one thing I want to look at. Exactly. To me, that's really a scarcity mindset. And it's an example of funders that are trying to save money, but they're saving it on the wrong things. And here's what I mean. You know, if you're a a nonprofit organization um, and you want to be successful and have a good impact on whatever you're working on, that requires investment. You know, you need talented people running that organization and working in that organization. You need strong infrastructure in the form of updated technology, strong financial management systems, strong fund development systems. You can raise money from a variety of places and accountability. You need a good strategy and all of those things cost money, right? They're not freely available. Too often donors think about, you know, how do I get the most money out the door to help the most people? So they want to fund the organization that claims, you know, 99 cents for every dollar will go to help poor children in Africa or, you know, whatever it might be, and only one cent is spent on overhead. And that's not really fair and it's not realistic. And we wouldn't do that to ourselves. We wouldn't do that in our businesses, right? Anyone that's running a business is thinking about how do we get the top talent? How do I invest in the right infrastructure? How do I do R&D to make sure we're innovative and have good customer service? So we're used to investing in ourselves in business, but often when it comes to philanthropy, it's like we lose our smarts and we think that, all the money should be helping people and not recognizing that in order to help them, you need the most talented, well-equipped nonprofit organizations to be able to do that. Are there some measures then? If, I'm tr- if I, my goal is to make the most impact then, what's mm-hmm. the measure I use to judge impact? How do I look at that if I'm just starting out in this area? Yeah, that's, that is the $64,000 question, whether you're starting out or you've been doing this for a while. <laughs> I'm sure. Because really it depends, right? It depends on the issue that you're trying to support, um, and it depends on what you're trying to learn. So what, what I always ask, tell my clients to do is, is ask, what do I want to learn? And then what's the best way to learn it? You know, pick an issue. Um, let's say you're trying to support early childhood education in your community, well, impact could be a variety of things, right? It depends on the situation. Impact could be helping more parents learn about the first 2,000 days of a child's life, those first five years, and how critical they are for learning and getting more parents to be able to read to their children every day and, and how that would hugely help kids to be able to be successful when they enter kindergarten. Or it could be there's not enough early childhood education centers in our community that people can access because they're too far away, people use public transportation, or maybe they they used to use public transportation. How do you make sure that these places are available, open, and convenient for parents who might be working two jobs to be able to get their kids to? Or you might think about, well, the point of early childhood education is to develop successful adults, right? So you might have a 18-year horizon where you think about, let's look at the end game. Are these kids successfully making it through high school? You know, early childhood, elementary school, middle school, and then high school, and then graduating, going off to college. And all of those are important. So it really depends on your perspective um, and where your kind of entry point is and what you think is important. And of course, you know, that should be based on actual need in your community. It sounds like much like a good financial plan for yourself, Chris, what you're saying is you have to take the time 
to ask the granular questions that are specific to your goal. Like you've, you've got to create your own set of goals first about what you want to achieve with this money instead of just dishing off cash to whoever you think is the, the cheapest provider. Exactly. And one of the things I really advocate for everybody is to have a strategy around their giving. And by strategy, I do not mean, you know, spending a year to create this complicated strategic plan that's going to be out for five years. I mean, just clarity. What's the kind of impact you want to have a year from now? Who do you want to be as a philanthropist a year from now? Where are you today? Whatever that is. And how, what do you think are the two, three, four most important things that will help you get from where you are today to where you want to be within a year? I can see, I can see, I I can see families, Chris, even talking about this though, around the dinner table. I mean, you work with some of the biggest organizations (laughs) and people that are giving millions and millions of dollars, but I could totally see a family around the dinner table talking about what do we want to achieve with this money that we're giving away? That's absolutely right. So strategy is relevant if you're an individual, a couple, a family, or the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation or the Gates Foundation. It, it, it's really, it's the same concept. It's just the scale is a little bit different. But if you're a family sitting around the dinner table, you could ask like, well, what kind of philanthropic family do we want to be, you know, in a year? That's a really interesting question right there. And what kind of impact or change do we want to see in our community? And, you know, the answer could be like, we don't really know. This is so new to us. We're not sure. And so where you are today is you don't really know. Where you want to be is more knowledgeable So that maybe a year from now, you have greater clarity and maybe a goal. And so an important steps you could take is to identify current issues that you care about, maybe nonprofits that you believe in, and spend some time learning about what the community needs are and making those connections so that a year from now or six months from now, you're much more equipped to decide, you know, what are the kinds of causes that we want to focus on as a family. It's funny you mentioned the Gates Foundation because I watched that documentary. I'm sure you probably did too, that Behind Bill's Brain documentary. Did you see that? I actually did not. Oh, I think for (laughs) for what you do, Chris, that is much CTV. But it's fascinating about the work that the foundation does. He's poured lots of money into a lot of projects and he's talked a lot about failures. Yeah. Do, Do you think that they're a good model to look at? Or do you think that a foundation like the Gates Foundation maybe makes too many mistakes, takes too many risks. I think they're a great model to look at for seeing that philanthropy isn't always successful, right? I mean, they've been hugely successful in a lot of their global health work, and now they're shifting a lot of their work toward this pandemic. And they're doing a lot of very innovative and risky things to do that, which I think is great. And they've also had a lot of failures, especially in their funding around some of their US-based educational initiatives. But what I think is great about that foundation is that they're willing to take risks and try new things, and they're willing to admit mistakes also and share what's not working. And I think that's really important because if you're afraid of failure, you're not going to take risks and you're not going to innovate and try new things, and you're really going to be maintaining the status quo. So I think for any funder to recognize that we all can be innovative, we all can not just solve a problem, but figure out how to make improvements and make things better. And that innovative gene is within all of us, right? You know, not just the creative and really smart people, but uh, you also need to think about prudent risk along the way and making, not every innovative idea is a good one. So you want to make sure that you're looking at prudent risk and assessing the, the cost and the benefit and the strategic fit with what you're trying to do. But essentially more funders should be taking greater risk because they have the ability to do so. There's not really a lot of accountability uh, in philanthropy. I have a question about, just getting out there. I remember when I first decided I was going to get involved in my community, I had a ton of trouble, Chris, just because I felt like I wanted to help, but I didn't, I didn't feel particularly passionate about one thing. Mm -hmm. How did you first get involved when it came to the area of giving? You know, I was very interested in U.S. military involvement in Central America, of all things. And I became involved, interested in that somewhere around like end of high school and in college. I'm not quite sure why. I think I just read enough about it uh, in the newspaper and became outraged. And so I got very involved as a student activist and then later ended up moving to California and San Francisco for my first job supporting human rights organizations in El Salvador and Central America. So that was really my impetus. I just sort of saw injustice and became interested in that and studied that and worked in that area. 
a lot of people, you know, some people come to their cause because of a personal experience. Somebody in their family was addicted to drugs or suffered from heart disease or Lyme disease or whatever it might be. And so they're passionate about that. But a lot of people like you and me, really, we're passionate about lots of different things. And there's no, not necessarily one particular cause that really calls us. Um, I think in that case, there's lots of things you can still do. I mean, there's lots of organizations you can support. And you can just think about, well, how about if I spend the next few months reading more, learning more about needs in my community? There's ample, usually, needs assessments and information about what's happening and sort of see what resonates and maybe pick one or two of them that are of most interest to me and really explore how can I make a difference in this area? What can I learn? Which are the best organizations to support? It doesn't need to be just in your community. It could be globally or it could be a national um, issue that you're wanting to support. But start somewhere, learn, and begin funding and supporting those causes and, and see what you learn about the impact that you're having with your giving. I found for me that was specifically the case. Once I got out there and I got my hands dirty, mm -hmm. it, it, everything changed. All of a sudden, yeah. I got much more passionate. Exactly. And, and we talked a little bit before about, you know, everyone's a philanthropist. And I believe that, you know, we don't just give our money, but we give our full selves, right? We can give... People refer to their time, talent, and treasure, right? You can volunteer your time, the talents that you have, be it you're a musician or you have scaled businesses or you know a lot about accounting, you know, whatever it might be, you have talent and insights and experience that others could really benefit from. You probably know people in your community who you could connect to nonprofits. You might know bankers and nonprofits certainly needed good relationships with bankers in the past few months as they were desperately trying to figure out how to respond to some of these federal loan programs. So there's lots of ways that you can help beyond giving money. Of course, money is always helpful, but I think it's important for funders to think about holistically who they are and how they can make a difference. One of my favorite chapters of your book, and sadly, we're not going to get to it, is chapter 10. <laughs> and, and, it's, it's, and it's how to go faster. You know, you talk yes. a lot about stripping away bureaucracy, making impact quicker and and I just love this. And by the way, even for people that aren't interested in giving, I don't know why you wouldn't be, but even for people that aren't interested in giving, just this idea of finding ways to go faster, working on your own priorities, thinking through things a little more clearly before you get into action, just fantastic. The book is called Delusional Altruism, Why Philanthropists Fail to Achieve Change and What They Can Do to Transform Giving. It's, it's available everywhere, Chris? Absolutely. You can go to delusionalaltruism.com and get links to all the retailers that are selling it. But of course, it's available on Amazon. And you also, on your consulting website, I noticed we kick this off by talking a little bit about COVID. You have uh, quite a few resources around COVID on your consulting site as well. I do. And one resource that uh, your listeners can turn to is a document. It's an article called Six Mistakes funders make in a crisis and what to do differently. And you can download it. It's free if you go to sixcrisismistakes.com. And it's an easy guide of things to avoid and what to do differently. Again, that's sixcrisismistakes.com. You know, usually, and our listeners tease us because I always say, if you're walking your dog, I will have a link in the show notes at stackybenjamins.com. But instead, because people were particularly picking on us yesterday, I'm going to say, if you're like our listener, John, and you're working out while you're listening to this, John, <laughs> we will have links in the show notes at stackybenjamins.com. Chris, thanks for hanging out with us and helping make us all better, more giving people. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Joe. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And man, do I miss watching baseball on TV with Joe's mom. Sure, the Tigers never win, but we can always complain together about the umps, and that's the most fun you can have on a summer night, am I right? Turns out today's the birthday of Baseball Hall of Famer, Wade Boggs. Now, if you aren't a baseball fan, don't worry. Old Doug's here to explain why this is important. See, not only is he well-known for his play on the baseball field, but maybe even better known for his weird superstitions. What am I talking about? How about this? Boggs ate chicken before every game, woke up at the same time every day, and he ran sprints exactly at 7.17 p.m. Well, if superstitions got that guy into the Hall of Fame, then surely they can help this guy get baseball back on TV. While I figure out all of my routines and exactly when I'm going to do them, why don't you take an at-bat with today's trivia? 
The question is, one beer company made a ton of money off Wade Boggs. Legend has it, Boggs once consumed 64 beers on a cross-country flight from Boston to L.A. And while the number is disputed, the beer of choice is not. What's Wade Boggs' favorite beer? I'll be back faster than you can go way back, way back, and gone! Well, the pandemic has made you think about working from home and you've decided to either get serious about that side gig or that passion project you've been working on. You may wonder, like I did when I first started searching around for help and expertise at a reasonable rate, where am I going to find that? The place to find great help so you can quickly pivot to meet your goal is Fiverr. There you'll be able to find on-demand talent. You know how much it costs. You can be certain that they'll deliver it on a timely basis. Fiverr's platform helps keep businesses moving with the network of trusted freelance talent. We've used Fiverr for everything from copy editors for the show to graphic design to, for us, lots and lots and lots of voice talent in many of the segments that you've heard here on Stacking Benjamins. The reason I went to Fiverr initially was because I didn't know where to look. And the reason I've stayed with Fiverr, though, is because of the fact that I've had such a great experience. And even though all the producers I find on Fiverr don't know each other, I can sort so easily and find the perfect person that it makes it simple for me to find somebody who's best in class at exactly what I need and I don't have to wonder about it. So whether you're launching your first business, scaling your current business, or in need of extra support to complete a project, Fiverr's here to help you evolve, adapt, and grow. Fiverr connects businesses with freelancers who offer hundreds of digital services, including graphic design, copywriting, web programming, film editing, and more. You'll find what you're looking for instantly. You can search by service, deadline, price, reviews, and more. And you know exactly what you're paying for up front. No negotiating needed. 24-7 customer support. Quality talent you can count on. Sellers have worked with some of the most influential brands in the world. It's really cool when we're able to hire somebody that has a history of working with big brands. And man, do they deliver. Check out Fiverr.com today. And you'll receive 10% off your first order by using code SB because you're a stacker. It's so easy. You'll find all the digital service you need in one place at FIVERR.com. Code SB, 10% off your first order because you're a stacker. That's Fiverr.com. Code SB. Hey, superstitious trivia fans. I'm back and not a moment too soon with your trivia. In fact, I timed it. From this point on, I will wait exactly 96 seconds for the trivia break. And each time Joe comments on one of his transitions, then I got to spit in a spittoon. Yeah, we got one of those down here. And last, and certainly not least, I will eat a nice big bowl of chili with extra beans before each and every show. Now, I'll go ahead and apologize right now to everybody about that. But look, if it brings back baseball, then it is all worth it, isn't it? Now that my routine is set, let's get back to today's trivia. The question is, one beer company made a ton of money off Wade Boggs. What's Wade Boggs' favorite beer? Well, old Wade drank only Miller Lite, which I hear is like having sex in a canoe. Why? Because they're both f***ing close to water, that's why. Now that that's done, let's go get baseball back, should we? See ya! Potty mouth. Nothing like the same old joke regurgitated from Doug. I have I've to say, I never heard that joke, but that's pretty oh, funny. Maybe heard it 96,000 times, but it is funny. Might be why Doug quoted it again. Hey, big thanks to Chris Putnam Walkerly for talking about giving. You know, these donor advised funds, OG, that she's talking about, really, man, the last few years have taken the world by storm. And for people that think that it's all complicated, makes giving a heck of a lot more easy. Could you say easier instead of more easy, which is not a word? Makes giving a lot be easy-ish. Donor advised funds are really cool. You can still give to whoever you want or whatever you want, but it allows you the opportunity to use some of that compounding 
to help with your giving. Give a little bit now, give a little bit later, but give way more later because of the return of your investing. Yeah, the returns can make your investments much, much bigger than you thought that they could. And you don't have to set up a whole foundation to do it. Right. Which is great. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline, OG, and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first, your loved ones, and your time. It's why they've created a modern way to buy quality term life insurance. Head to stackybenjamins.com now to get a free quote. But of course, they'll be here when you finish the show. So stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life. Prices are affordable. Policies issued by the parent company, Mass Mutual. A super simple online application that actually lately, believe it or not, just became even easier. And today... We're throwing out the Haven Lifeline to our friend, Maddie. Say hi, Maddie. Hi. Um, I recently started saving more for retirement. I've been trying to find more resources, but a lot of what I see assumes that I need to save for a family down the road. Are there big financial planning differences for people who don't want kids? Thanks for that question, Maddie. You know, it's interesting, OG, uh, how, how often... I think financial companies assume, hey, you want to put the kids through college? Uh, no, I don't. I like how she asked, is there big planning differences between kids and no kids? And I just want to be I'm like, yeah, let's see. You could plan on having a vacation house. You could plan on having a Ferrari. <laughs> you could plan on private air travel. There's all sort of cool stuff you could plan on without having kids. Matty OG thinks about them. <laughs> Every day. In fact, that's why he Ferraris. That's what I call them. My little Ferraris running around. (laughs) You beat me to it. I was going to say it's weird when uh, OG always refers to his daughter as Aston Martin, but I'm like, her name's not Aston. Yeah. My little, uh, who's your, who's daddy's little Bentley. (laughs) Who's daddy's country club membership. I think the good news, Maddie, from where I sit, we'll let OG weigh in on this one. You're welcome, OG. I'm going to let you weigh in on this one. Is is that uh, you can really focus on long term more? I mean, I I I just know when I was a financial planner, man, people would focus long term. Kids would come, and it was a big, giant, freaking speed bump. You couldn't save as much, and when you did save, you were saving for stuff that was shorter term. And so, no offense, Nick and Autumn. Your dad just called you a speed bump. <laughs> your ability. A big, giant freaking speed bump. <laughs> but your, your ability to earn a lot of interest on that money and play the long game becomes a lot, uh, a lot more difficult. I think the biggest thing is flexibility because, because of not having those three little lovely speed bumps along the way <laughs> spaced out evenly. Uh, because of that, you have so much more flexibility. Do you want to you know, take a couple of years off in the middle and have like a little sabbatical type thing. Probably could do that. Somebody that has a six-year-old, a four-year-old and a two-year-old, not as easy. Not saying you can't do it, but definitely not as easy. You want to be aggressive like our friend Andy and pay off your house. Now he did it with kids, of course, but pay your house off super fast. You don't have to drag it out 30 years because you're trying to pay for tuition and daycare and all that other sort of stuff. You can knock it out in five And I think the flexibility that comes with that allows you both ends of it. So you could say, hey, I'm good with my career. I love what I do. And I'm happy with a quote unquote standard retirement. Let's say age 60. Well, because you don't have all those things in the middle, you also now are able to allow yourself to do a lot of fun stuff. Now we were just talking about giving, for example, that could be your kid. Your kid could be giving money away, Mm -hmm. Um, but you have tons of flexibility to do that without having those those little monsters running around. And I don't know what the average is. I think they say the average cost, not including college, to raise a kid's a quarter million. So um, I was thinking also, depending on what Maddie's doing, what her career is, it may mean that the emergency fund maybe can be a little lighter. I think when you're feeding children and people that aren't bringing in a paycheck, it means that your emergency fund maybe has to be- you, Mrs. OG. <laughs> I was looking at the three baby OGs. Like, what do you guys do? How come you're not? Uh, listen, you're eight years old. It's time for you to get a full time job. Yeah. Uh, but if they're not bringing a paycheck and there's more expenses going out, then the emergency fund has to be bigger. I remember when your kids went off to college after they got done with college, you guys were like dancing like crazy. 
like we we don't even spend money on groceries anymore. We can't we can't like where who ate all this food? <laughs> like you're like our grocery budget was a thousand bucks a month and now it's three hundred because it's just us. I used to laugh that the University of Texas meal plan that Nick was on was a huge win for me. Like I would pay that versus groceries for that kid any day. He's a competitive swimmer and he was a human furnace uh, when yeah. it came to food. And man, did they take a beating. University of Texas tuition, I think that some of those tuition increases are due to my kid. Thanks. You're welcome, Texas. Yeah. Big thanks for that question, Maddie. Hashtag jealous. Yes. If, 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 if you've got to come on, I know you're not jealous. You love your kids. Uh, I, I love my kids. It would also be great if they came with a pile of money when the stork dropped them off. If the stork was like, here's your baby and a hundred thousand dollars. Oh, hashtag spoiler. Oh, is that not what happens? Is you're, that what happened to you guys? You're sp spoiling it for everybody that that doesn't happen. Oh yes. yeah. I see. No, honey, we got to have kids because they come with a bundle of money. Yeah. T turns out that's a lie. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. If you would like to be as cool as Maddie and not only leave us an awesome question like she did, but also we're going to send her a greatest money show on earth circus t-shirt so that you can celebrate the circus. That's the stacking Benjamin show. Speaking of celebrating, we are going to be celebrating restacking your Benjamins Wednesday night. That'll be on our YouTube channel. I hope you can join us over there. Go to YouTube dot com search for the stacking benjamins channel and you will find that we are going to have uh, some great institutions joining us we talked about earlier last week that fidelity investments are joining us and also morningstar is joining us we can also announce that our friends at tiaa are going to join us for that and we'll tell you more on wednesday but oh gee the event just i'll be wearing tuxedos the event just gets better and better um, and I can't wait to tell you what else is going to happen there, but, uh, it will be live on YouTube, seven to 9 PM Eastern on the stacking Benjamins YouTube channel, two hours long, go. two hours long. That's right. Well, it is in two days, isn't it? We should probably tell people who else is going to be there then. Well, you know, I mean, or you could drum roll it when they get there. <laughs> That's right. Leave I'm it sure a surprise. I will sure also tell you that we're going to have experts also from T row price and uh, why don't we just spill the rest of the beans? We have uh, two other great shows that are affiliated with us. Money with Friends and Bobby Rebel will be joining us to help uh, MC the event, as will our friend Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. So we've got our full team out and experts from Fidelity, Morningstar, TIA, T. Rowe Price joining us. It's going to be the great. Whole kit and caboodle. Two hours of advice from some really smart people. So whether you're looking and us and <laughs> correct, <laughs> and we're just on their coattails. Hang See, on. we know them. We know these smart people. Yes, it's going to be fantastic. All right. I uh, hope you can join us on Wednesday. That's going to do it for today. If you need a better team in your corner to help you with your financial planning, by the way, head to uh, stackybenjamins.com forward slash OG. And that will lead you to their calendar where you can begin the conversation about how they can interface with you to make your team better as you're restacking Benjamins. Okay, that's going to do for today. Doug, take it from your man. What should we have learned? Oh, oh, sure. I see what's going on here, Joe. Pretty much, you're saying this podcast is in the bottom of the ninth. We got two outs and a runner on third. You need me to knock a nice little single to right center so we can drive the winning run home, right? You bet, man. First, take a lesson from our headline. Want to lose money? Invest in a bunch of stuff that sounds cool, but that you really don't understand. Maybe Bob at work isn't the best source of investment opportunities on the planet, you think? Second, take a lesson from Chris Putnam Walkerly. If you really want to change the world with your donation, it might take more than just writing a check. But the big takeaway... Don't talk to a diehard Tiger fan like Joe's mom about Wade Boggs. You know what she said? You know how dumb Wade Boggs is? He has to get naked to count to 21. I said, hey, 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 easy, ma, but she wouldn't quit. She said, Wade Boggs is so dumb it takes him an hour and a half to watch 60 Minutes. I said, whoa, you can't talk. Hey, we're Tiger fans. Well, that should have stopped her, but it didn't. 
She said, you know, Doug, Wade Boggs is so dumb, he had to go into a dressing room at the stadium to change his mind. Wow, that lady's brutal. Do not mess with her. Go Tigers! Special thanks to Chris Putnam Walkerly for stopping by the basement. You can learn more about Chris by stopping by our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com or you'll find her book, Delusional Altruism, wherever books are sold. This show is created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rudder Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjaminsCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I swear the worst part about coming over to Joe's mom's house is having to put on pants. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. And a big apology to Wade Boggs. I didn't make those jokes, Mr. Boggs. Joe's mom did. If you get superstitious about this, you go after her. Big fan, Mr. Boggs. Big fan. So we were talking about early successes and people getting the wrong lesson. That story of that guy, man. I had that happen when I first learned to play craps and <laughs> I was giving financial planning speeches on behalf of other advisors and uh, the top advisor in the nation for Ameriprise. Well, what's funny is the t top advisor in the nation for Ameriprise, he had uh, offices in Detroit where I was and in Las Vegas. And so he hired me to do a couple of Detroit events. Then we had great success. So he said, I want to fly you to Vegas to do a bunch of events there. So I went to Las Vegas four times, I think, to give financial planning speeches, which is to your point, an oxymoron. And they always were at a casino in a, in a ballroom at the casino, but I don't really gamble at that time. I, <laughs> At that time, I didn't really gamble. And frankly, I still gamble maybe once a year because the whole slot machine thing doesn't interest me. Blackjack, I just seems very mechanical. You got a rule, you stick with it. Okay. I heard one guy say recently that Las Vegas is for people who don't really understand odds. There are a lot better odds that you can have on your money. But I do like, I do like the excitement and the yelling and hollering I always have uh, around the craps table. I just could never understand it. So a friend of mine said, one of the guys that hired me said, hey, you want to go learn how to play craps? To his assistant, Beth, and I, both of us. And we both said, yeah, we, we, I've always wanted to learn how to play craps. And he said, well, we're going to go to Excalibur because they have the cheapest tables. And I'm thinking, you know, mom plays nickel slots, right? I'm thinking, okay, what's a big amount of money to take with you when you go gamble? Maybe 20 bucks, 50 bucks. He goes, you should probably bring $300. You can get away with $200. And I went, oh my God, no. But I'd already committed, but I'd already committed to it. And I knew, by the way, then if I called home and I told Cheryl that I was taking $200 out of the bank to gamble, that there were going to be some problems. So I didn't know what to do. You think? I didn't know what to do. 
So you know what I did? I did the dumbest thing possible. I went to the ATM. I took out the 200 bucks and I said, I hope this goes well. And? And I go to the table and Mark stands there with Beth and I, and he said, okay, do you want to know, do you want the quick rule instruction or do you want the long instruction on how to play craps? Guess which one Beth and I picked? Quick. The quick one. He said, okay, here's the quick one. Take your $200, hand it to that guy with a stick because that's where it's going. <laughs> Which didn't give me, didn't give me any, any feeling that was good at all. I'm like, oh, this is going to suck. He goes, okay, now I'll tell you the, the long way. And he, and he showed me how to play. And within a half an hour, OG, I'm up $80 on my 200 bucks, which was bad because I thought this game is freaking phenomenal. So then this the, is easy. So then the next day, this guy that doesn't gamble, I take $200, which now, by the way, is only $120 of my money because I'm doing that math. I'm like, hey, Cheryl can only hate me now if I lose 120 because I got the 80 that I already that I already have. So I'm in less hot water if I do this. So I go down again and guess what happens? I win 80 bucks again in about 25 minutes. And so the next time I go to Vegas, I go to the casino with my 200 bucks. I win $80 again. I think it's fantastic. So I'm back in Detroit. I took some clients to a hockey game and my client casually says that he likes to go to the casino once in a while. And I said, very truthfully, I'm like, you know, I really don't gamble, but recently I started playing craps. I just learned how, and I've, and this game is fantastic. In fact, I've won every time. And I, and I laughingly said, I said, and it, it seems too good to be true, but I think I have a good system. Like, I think I've, I've, oh, gee, I have cracked the lock. You're, you have finally figured it out. I've got it. To the point that I ordered a casino game for my computer. And I don't know what happened on this, on this game, but even playing the computer game, I used the same thing and I was winning. I'm like, if I just stick with this and do it to all the stupid things I see people do at the table, if I stay very conservative, I will win money. So I go to the casino with my client. I'm like, yeah, let's go to the casino. They go off to play some, some slots and I go to the craps table. I'm thinking maybe seven minutes in and I've lost all my money. So then I think this never happens. This doesn't happen. And this is kind of like this guy in this Wall Street Journal commercial, right? I'm like, hey, this doesn't happen. I, I win every time. So I took more money. I went and got another 200 bucks. Lost that in the next, I'm going to say 12 minutes. It was gone. And so then I had to go to Cheryl. And I said, yeah, remember all that winning I did with that craps game? I lost 400 bucks last night. I'm out. Oh, that was not good. So... Fast forward a few years later, many years later, my son has uh, his job in Seattle and we're driving across country. And he said, dad, I've heard you talk about craps before. I'd like to learn how to play. I'm like, cool. My son and I on this road trip across country, we saw the Cadillac ranch, you know, all those Cadillacs no, that's the bunny ranch. No, no, we didn't see the bunny ranch to be clear. We saw the butts of cars. They were uh -huh. naked, but they were cars up in a field. Gotcha. They weren't naked, actually. They were all spray painted. I see. We saw that. They had tassels. We st we stopped at that. Uh, like tassels. We stopped at that place where they, you know, people have to eat the big steak in X amount of time. The big Texan uh -huh. the had big stopped there, yeah. and we watched uh, some guy just go down in flames. But anyway, we had fun. We went to all these places. So we go to Las Vegas, and Cheryl is doing a continuing education class for her job there, and. And so Nick and I go gamble and I take him downtown. It was, it was super fun. I show him how to play craps. I crack the same stupid joke about, you want to know the quick way or the, he falls into that too. Yeah. Show me the quick way. So I teach him how to play. Nick wins like 70 bucks the first time he plays. And he's like, this game's great. And then the next day he wants to play again. So Nick says, we got to go play again. And he wins again. And then, oh gee, he wins again the next night. And then he wins against the next night. And, uh, you've seen this movie <laughs> and he's just every day he's packing. The, he's like, dad, we going to go gamble. So we're there for the last day we're there day three. And Nick and I, Nick says, let's go down to the craps table. So we do. And, uh, immediately I'm up like 120 bucks. 
but we had a show the next day. So I, I said, Hey, I'm going to go up and edit the show. And Nick was up maybe 70 or $80. And I said, you should, you should probably leave too. But he's like, no, man, I'm, I'm staying down here. This is, this is fantastic. And so I go up to the room and Cheryl said, how are you guys doing? And I said, I, I made money again. It's, it's I get unbelievably lucky. I mean, now I know it was unbelievably lucky. I said, but I think we have a problem. It's our son's first time gambling. He's been more excited about it. He got excited on day one, more excited on day two. He's thrilled here on day three. I am super worried about our kid. About an hour and 15 minutes later, Nick comes in and slams the door. And Cheryl's like, what's going on? He's like, I lost all my money. <laughs> yes. And then I took the money I won and I lost all that too. This is stupid. We got to get out of here. Cheryl and I are like, oh, thank God. Oh, thank God. 